Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Tonight we're very lucky to be joined by Ed Liu, who's come across to us from uh, B612 Foundation, um, where he's the CEO. Uh, Ed uh, did a, an electrical engineering bachelor's at Cornell uh, and then uh, an applied physics PhD at Stanford, um, and where he was uh, specializing in solar physics. Uh, and then after he uh, graduated, he did a postdoc at the Institute for Astronomy in Hawaii. And uh, then in 1994, he joined the NASA Astronaut Corps and, uh, and flew first in 1997 on STS-84 and then uh, in 2000 on STS-106, where he did a six-hour uh, spacewalk uh, um, in construction of the ISS. And then in 2003, he spent six months on the ISS. Uh, and uh, in 2007, he retired from NASA uh, to come back to the Bay Area. And uh, he was first working with Google uh, and then last year he started work at uh, Liquid Robotics as uh, the Chief of Innovative Operations. Uh, but tonight we're going to hear from him about another role that uh, we was first uh, came to our attention and the public's attention in June last year uh, when uh, it was announced that the B612 Foundation was being formed. Uh, and I'm not going to talk any more about uh, Ed's role in that because I'm sure we're going to learn from him about it in his talk tonight. So. Please join me in welcoming Ed. Yeah, I now have this on and it appears to be working. Very good. Uh, thanks. It's an, an honor to be here at SETI. Um, I've known about SETI for God uh, decades since uh, I was in grad school. I always found this place uh, to be a, uh, an inspirational place to me. So it's, it's neat to be here. So. Um, I've entitled this talk, Saving the World. It's metaphorical, but in some sense, that sort of summarizes what we're really trying to do. And uh, I'd like to tell you about our work at the B612 Foundation. So first, let's start out with an observation. Uh, there is a lot of empty space out there. Space is mostly empty space uh, in our solar system, but it is not completely empty. There are a lot of things whizzing around out there. There are a lot of things... Uh, um, surrounding the Earth, but more what I'm concerned about is things that are orbiting the Sun along with the Earth. So let's take a look at what that really looks like, and you'll have to excuse the fact that I start and stop uh, videos. So let me show you what our solar system looks like. These are all the known asteroids in our solar system. All these orbits are correct. From the, it's from the JPL database. That's the Earth's orbit right there. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. That's the asteroid belt. Again, all these orbits are, are proper. Um, there's a little funniness to the way they goop because of the fact that we're moving around. It was originally rendered on a planetarium dome, so the, there's some a little funny business in, in what it looks like on a flat screen. But you can see that there's a lot of things moving around. These asteroids here are called the near-Earth asteroids, the ones not in the asteroid belt. And these are the ones whose orbits essentially cross Earth's orbit and which uh, are at risk of running into the Earth. Now, we know that we don't know of all of these asteroids because we've only surveyed a some small fraction of the volume around the Earth. There's really about a factor of 100 more of those larger than that the one that hit Tuggluska. I'll explain that later. But this is really what um, the real situation looks like. If you multiply that same distribution by 100, you see that the solar system is indeed a very, very busy place. And uh, you know, it's a little misleading here because you have to brighten up the dots here. They are the real asteroids are much smaller, obviously, than the size of the dot, so it looks like it fills space. But these are, the locations are correct. So what it essentially means is the Earth is flying around in, in, in essentially a shooting gallery. And, and, uh, and things, <laughs> things occasionally hit the Earth. So let's go back over here. So how many things hit the Earth? Well, we actually know this pretty darn well, as it turns out. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures I took uh, from the space station. There's the moon up above the uh, atmosphere of the Earth. And I'm just pointing out that um, there's a lot of craters on the moon. And the moon, not having a, an atmosphere to speak of, uh, the atmosphere doesn't stop most asteroids coming down. It doesn't have weather to, to uh, erase ast uh, asteroid impact craters like you do here on Earth. And you get these craters, and you can count them. And uh, after a while, the, the, the craters, they, they begin to land on top of each other. But you can do this math. And essentially what you're doing is counting craters and, and then making a correction for the fact 
fact that the moon is smaller than the Earth. And, uh, and you can actually tell how often the Earth has been hit by larger asteroids. These are smaller asteroids. Um, this is a, uh, just a fireball. Um, anybody here see the fireball that was uh, about a, maybe two months ago, something like that? Anybody here? I heard it. I did, anybody here uh, remember that? It landed in uh, Marin County, I believe, um, some pieces of it. And uh, those, those, happen, those are the sort of smaller cousins. So the first thing to, to understand is that asteroids come in all sizes. From the big type of thing uh, that, that, for instance, uh, 10 kilometer or larger asteroid is what killed off the dinosaurs, to sort of the smaller cousins, to the very smaller cousins like this. This is maybe the size of a car or something like that. Uh, to the very, very small ones are just the standard shooting stars you see. But we actually know, so this is an eye chart, and there will be a quiz on this, but um, essentially what it is is uh, number of asteroids this way or versus diameter. Okay, so this is size of asteroids, and it's conveniently labeled in kilometers. Um, and uh, this is, the other way to look at number is how often they hit the Earth. So size translates to impact energy. The bigger it is, the, you know, you could convert you know, kilometers into megatons, right? So one kilometer asteroid, that's about uh, um, 10 to the, three times 10 to the four, four uh, megatons. That's, that's ginormous uh, technical term. Um, and you can also tell by looking at, so the, the blue dots here are the observed distribution of asteroids. So at the low end, we see these actually by looking downwards with satellites that are actually been looking downwards to actually look for nuclear weapons tests. What they mostly see is not nuclear weapons tests. It is asteroids hitting the upper part of the atmosphere. And that data has been declassified. And you can count these things. So this data is known. It, it, you can actually see the error bars on here. They're, it's quite small. At the upper end, this is from counting craters. The middle end, this is from using our telescope to look out in the uh, solar system and knowing what fraction of the solar system we can actually uh, see at any given time. You can, uh, and, and this is the observed distribution. Um, so lots of small asteroids, not so many big asteroids. Um, let's look at some numbers. So um, the interesting thing about this is this, this distribution is really well known, which means we know the odds of things hitting the Earth. So, so what are they? Um, I call it cosmic roulette because essentially what, that's what it is. Um, let's look at uh, what I've done here is I said I've, I've, I've made a table that says, how big of an impact are we talking about? And what are the odds in 100 years that there will be such an impact? And then I tried to give it, put it in terms that people sort of every day can understand, uh, things that people can appreciate. And so let's look at a five megaton impact. Uh, Tunguska, June 30th, 1908, was an explosion of about five megatons. It was about a 45 meter asteroid. Uh, luckily struck out in Siberia, wiped out an area roughly the size of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, uh, for reference, uh, 15 kilotons was the drop, bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So, you know, 15 kilotons. So this is many hundreds of times larger. Okay. Um, those happen about every 300 years or so. Uh, so in other words, in 100 years, in, in your kid's lifetime, for instance, uh, there's about a 30% chance that there'll be, there'll be one of these. Okay. So what's a... What's a Odd that people understand. All, you know, I just looked at the National Safety Council and they give the odds of you dying from all sorts of stuff. So your odds of dying of cancer are about 23%. You know, so um, that's roughly the odds that so, during your lifetime there will be a, an impact, a random impact of uh, sort of you know, 500 times larger than Hiroshima. Okay. Most of the Earth is unpopulated. But uh, sure would be a shame if it landed on a place that wasn't unpopular. Uh, let's look at something larger. Um, 100 megatons, that's roughly 140 meters. 100 megatons, just for scale. All the bombs used in World War II, if you add them all up, set them all off at once in one place, that's about 20 megatons. Okay, so this is big. The largest nuclear weapon ever tested uh, was something called the Tsar Bomba, which means sort of king of the bomb. Uh, it was 50 megatons, and it was set off in a particular remote location. 
Uh, so this is, you know, a typical nuclear weapon is about one megaton. So this is about a, a hundred sort of large nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, depends on where it hits, right? Could be nothing or could be really bad. Right? My, my personal feeling is that uh, a random hundred megaton explosion somewhere on the surface of the earth is something we should avoid. So, in 100 years, roughly in your lifetime, there's a 1% chance that that'll happen. That's small, right? 1%. 1% is also about your chance of dying in a, in a car accident in your lifetime. That's, you know, on your death certificate, it's about a 1% chance it's going to read car accident. Okay? And uh, again, statistics from National Safety Council. So, I'll put the question out to you all. Who here wears a seatbelt? Who here would drive, buy a brand new car that didn't have airbags? Why? You only have a 1% chance in your entire life of dying in a car accident. Why? Because it's stupid not to, right? <laughs> okay, so again, so you know, you can translate this another way, right? Because these two numbers are the same and your lifetime is about 100 years. Each and every single day, the odds of the Earth being hit by a random 100 megaton explosion due to an asteroid is the same as you dying that same day in a car accident. Okay? So it puts it in perspective, right? It's not zero. It's a small number, right? What's to worry about, right? And the difference, as I always tell people, is that in this case, we're all riding in the same car. Right? So, you know, again, the, it, this is not large enough to, you know, this is not going to wipe out the world. Could it cause global economic collapse? If it hits in the wrong place, yeah. I mean, look at the effects of, uh, there was, a, there was a, an earthquake in Japan uh, a little over a year ago. It was, a, uh, it was an undersea earthquake, and it put up a tsunami of roughly three to four meters, which was focused higher in certain places, but three to four meter tsunami. And it had a measurable drop in the world's gross domestic product happened that year because of that. You know, the repercussions of that. That is tiny compared to something like this, right? And so, you know, the, with our interconnected world being the way it is today, um, things that, uh, you know, a thousand years ago may not have made much of a difference could actually cause global economic collapse today. Okay, let's look at the, the much bigger ones. In a random 100-year interval, a one-kilometer asteroid, that's 40 gigatons, that is huge. Um, there's about a 0.01% chance uh, of that happening in your lifetime. Okay. Now this is generally accepted one kilometer through work done by like David and other people that, that that's likely the end of human civilization. Okay. And the reasoning behind that is roughly that this is big enough to throw enough dust in the upper atmosphere to cut off growing seasons worldwide for a few years and the earth having a worldwide food stockpile of a few months, that implies that you're going to run out of food in, in the middle of this. And that implies very bad things some years later as people fight over the last scraps of food. So uh, one kilometer asteroid, 0.01% uh, in a random 100 year interval. Okay, so what's that roughly equivalent to? You can go down the list of thing, things that you can die from, and you find that almost exactly the same percentage is your ads of dying in an aircraft accident. Anybody here scared of flying? One person. <laughs> Who here loves flying? Yay, much better. Um, but um, you know, th those odds are not large, but they're not zero either, right? And so the question is, should we should we do something about this? Okay. Now, I, I, I made a point of saying that this is the odds in a random 100-year interval, and that's because NASA initiated a survey called Space Guard Survey uh, some decade and a half ago. What year did it start, David? 95, 96, something like that? Um, and they, their goal was to find asteroids one kilometer and larger. And they have succeeded in finding over 90% of those now. So that means, and, and of those, we know that none of them is actually going to hit us in roughly the next 100 years. So the, the odds for the next 100 years, because of the fact that we've measured these, found the majority of these things, is, is quite a bit less than that. Okay, but we, we haven't found them all yet. But you know, it's 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 nice to know that that um, you know our chance of our civilization being wiped out in your lifetime is uh, not as high as that. It's not zero either. 
So here's the sort of non-intuitive part to people. A lot of people assume that the hardest part about this problem is deflecting the asteroid. That's actually not true. Um, a number of us have spent um, a number of years actually looking at this problem of how you deflect asteroids. And remember that the vast majority of the cases, because of the odds are stacked towards the lower ends, and you, you, the, the case you're going to end up with is one of a smaller asteroid likely hitting the Earth. And so how would, you, how would you deflect an asteroid? Well, it turns out orbital mechanics is your friend. Remember that picture I showed you of, of all of the uh, asteroids orbiting the solar system? What you actually are going to do is find an asteroid and track it many, many, many orbits before it hits the Earth. So decades. Think decades ahead of time. And that means that tiny, tiny, tiny changes in the speed of an asteroid in its velocity Actually, remember the Earth's a moving target. Okay, what you really need to do is upset the timing where the Earth and, and that asteroid's appointment is some time off in the future. It turns out that if you have decades of notice, then you only really need to change the velocity of, an, of a typical asteroid some fraction of a centimeter per second. So one centimeter per second is moving about this fast. So a fraction of a centimeter per second. Think the speed at which an ant crawls. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that's a few millimeters per second if you sit around and watch ants, okay? Um, the typical orbital speed of these things, the Earth's orbital speed, is roughly the Earth's orbital speed, which is about 65,000 miles per hour. So I'll switch units back and forth here to screw people up. But uh, 65,000 miles per hour, it's really fast, okay? Um, now, if you make it 65,000 miles per hour plus the speed at which an ant walks, that collision is averted, okay? So... You don't necessarily need Bruce Willis to do this job. Okay? Um, so what do you do? You can simply run into it with a small spacecraft. Um, this, this is just a little video of what such a thing might look like. That's a small spacecraft. And what you're going to do is basically um, you know, fly it right into an asteroid and change its velocity. This is like billiards, right? So there you go. Um, by the way, that's a real model of the asteroid Itakawa. Um, you could do, if you need to, and, and in many cases you will need to um, finally adjust the velocity to make sure that it doesn't come back and get you a few orbits later. Um, <laughs> this is called a gravity tractor. Basically, you're going to hover above the surface. This is a simulation done at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, basically, the, the, the thrusters are pointed slightly outwards. They're not straight downwards. And you hover near it, and there's a tiny gravitational pull between the a small spacecraft, something like a one-ton, you know, typical small spacecraft and, a, and, and an asteroid. And what's nice about it is you don't have to get that close to it because they're crumbly, their surfaces are, are weak, and uh, you can tow it, actually. So it's like towing an aircraft carrier by pulling on it with a very, very, very tiny force. And if you, and if you uh, hover near a, a, an asteroid, sort of a, one of these moderate-sized asteroids, you know, uh, something like a football stadium-sized asteroid, then you can change its velocity by fraction of a millimeter per second, which is enough to, if you find that you've caused an asteroid to miss the Earth, to make sure that you don't get into what's called a return keyhole. I won't get into that tonight, but for those here, and there are experts in the audience, this is, would be used for essentially fine-tuning a deflection. So we worked on this for about 10 years, and we... Uh, and a number of others, uh, really, I think pretty much um, understand that you can, you can deflect asteroids if you have decades of notice. It's all about the warning time. Um, you know, it's, if it's easy to hit a target if it's right in front of you, and it's hard to prevent from being hit if, if something's right in front of you, but move it way, away away from you, you know, give it 50 years from hitting you, and, the, and it's easy to prevent an impact. So, uh, it's all about the warning time. Um, is it your quote or is it Don's? That uh, three rules are find them early, find them early, and find them early. Is that your quote, Don? Don. Or, or it's Don's quote or John? Yeah. Okay. It's true. <laughs> and uh, your quote is the one about the McDonald's, right? Yeah. Uh, Dave's quote here, famous quote, oft repeated, is that the number of people working on the problem of asteroid deflection. This was ten years ago is roughly, what, two shifts at a McDonald's, correct? <laughs> There's a McDonald's in Moscow, by the way, that's enormous. That, that would be about 100 people. But, um, so the, the corollary to this, you know, 
you have to have lots of warning. And so we were left in this sort of uh, rather strange situation where we have found the larger asteroids, not so much the smaller ones. You can find the smaller asteroids as a result of looking for the larger asteroids, but uh, you don't find as many because they're just, you have, they have to come much closer to the Earth for you to see them in order for you to find them. So it's much easier to find the bigger asteroids, right? Looking with telescopes. Um, there was an, uh, an, a change to NASA's Authorization Act. For those who spend time in Washington, D.C., um, they understand that that is what NASA or any federal agency is allowed to spend its money on. Uh, in 2006, they did change NASA's Authorization Act so that NASA was authorized to go look for asteroids smaller than a kilometer. Uh, it, it was not followed with an appropriations to fund it. Okay, so it, it doesn't happen, and it hasn't happened. And I gave a talk uh, about uh, just about a year and a half ago um, over at Google where I used to work, and I was explaining this sort of strange situation that we could, we had the technology to deflect an asteroid if we knew one was coming, but we weren't really looking for the vast majority of them. So um, if you look at raw numbers, what we've discovered, we have discovered about 10,000 uh, near-Earth asteroids. Those are the ones I showed you in the beginning. And uh, the majority of those are smaller ones. Uh, only about 1,000 of those are larger than a kilometer. Now the number of near-Earth asteroids, remember I showed you the number of the real ones out there, the number larger than the one that struck in Tunguska, the sort of five megaton explosion, is about a million. So we have discovered less than 1% of what's out there that's larger than Tunguska. And so, you know, when I said that we're flying around in, the solar, in a shooting gallery, we're actually flying around the shooting gallery with our eyes closed because we're not looking for them. And I was sort of lamenting this fact when a guy came up to me at the end in the, you know, typical Google fashion said, well, why don't you just go and do it? <laughs> and, and his point was essentially that you could, there's two ways you could go about doing this. You could figure out how to work the halls of Washington, D.C. and make it happen. Or you could figure out a way to raise the money and go do it. And so that's what we at the B612 Foundation decided to do. I'll take a little aside here, by the way. Um, the B612 Foundation. Um, anybody here ever read The Little Prince? One of my favorite books. But the home of The Little Prince, anybody remember the name of the asteroid he lived on? It's B612. So that's where the, the name of our organization came from, in case anybody was wondering. So um, we are uh, raising money to build uh, a space telescope to find near-Earth asteroids. And we're, we intend to map the ones down to, uh, essentially completely down to 140 meters, and the great majority of those down to sort of the Tunguska size. And we know how to do that, too. Um, a couple things about asteroids. They're A, um, very dark. They're, they're almost charcoal black in most cases. Um, they reflect a very small amount of the light, which makes them difficult to spot using visible <laughs> telescopes. And uh, however, if you're dark and you're orbiting the sun, you are warmed by the sun and you glow in infrared. Because the background sky is cold in infrared, that means that asteroids stand out. So if you have an infrared telescope, you can actually spot asteroids much, much better. This has been well known for a long time. The problem is that infrared telescopes don't work very well from the ground because infrared light is absorbed by water vapor and the atmosphere is filled with water vapor and doesn't work very well. So you have to go to space if you want. So, you know, the cost is mounting now, right? You need to build a space telescope that absorbs an infrared. The next thing, if you think back to that video of, of the Earth orbiting the the sun, and think that, well, the ones that cross Earth's orbit, they spend a lot of their time between the Earth and the sun, right? So if you were to look for them with a telescope, uh, you know, near the Earth, you'd be looking towards the sun, which isn't the greatest way to look for things. Um, you want to position your telescope between the sun and the Earth looking outwards so you can scan Earth's orbit, right? You don't need to be next to the Earth. You need to find these things many, many, many orbits before they hit the Earth. This has the added advantage, um, for those who know a little bit about orbit mechanics, and everyone should, um, the closer you are to the central body, the faster you orbit. 
So if you put yourself in inwards, your orbit is, is less than one year, and you will go around the sun faster than the Earth. And that allows you to scan the other side of the sun, because at times, you've been the other side of the sun. So that's what we're doing. We are building a space telescope, which we call Sentinel. And I will show you what that looks like. So this is Sentinel, being built by Ball Aerospace. Um, this size of this is roughly the size of a FedEx moving truck. This is about 25 feet from top to bottom. Um, it's about 1,600 pounds, so it's a, it's a pretty good sized spacecraft. And it, it, it's, it is an infrared space telescope. So what we've done is we've taken that same anatomically correct distribution of asteroids. Those are the green dots. We've taken the infrared background sky from a, uh, as observed by a, a, one of the NASA observatories called WISE. And we've put this thing in its proper orbit, run the simulation, and these are actually all the known asteroids moving uh, around. Remember, there's about 100 times more than this. So the sky is filled with these things. And what this thing is going to do is circle the sun and look for these moving objects. Because the ones that are moving are the asteroids. And if you take repeated images of the sky, you can track these things across the sky, and you can calculate their orbits. And so what we're going to do is, is make a dynamical map of the solar system. So that video I showed you earlier, it's going to be filled with real data when this mission is done. So here is where Sentinel is going to orbit. Remember I said it, that's the purple line is its orbit. This light green line is Earth's orbit. And it will be able to see an area roughly like this as it scans outwards. And you see as it rotates around the sun, so here's the Earth, see it's moving faster than the Earth, it's now seeing the Earth, and now it's, it's spotting all these asteroids and tracking all these ones, and it, as it scans around it will then pick up all these asteroids as it moves around the sun. So what we have done is uh, essentially reframe the problem. It's a quote I like, it's from uh, General Dwight Eisenhower, and he, he once said, uh, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. And it, what he really meant by that is that sometimes it pays to think about the problem, you know, step back a little bit and, and try and look at the problem in a, in a different manner. Maybe you're answering, maybe you're trying to solve the wrong problem. Because sometimes the solution to a problem uh, is not a function of how difficult the problem is. Right? It could be easier to solve a, 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 a larger problem. So what we've essentially done, what this guy at Google got us to do by asking the right question was, how do you change the conversation from how do we get you know, an appropriations bill for NASA to you know, how, do, how do you work the halls of Washington to, to get this to happen to how do you save the world? And how do you, you know, again, metaphorical, but you know, it, how do you find donors who are, who are willing to do that? You know, that, that guy came up to us with a very specific thing. He, he told us um, that he had just donated to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, which is the museum up on Van Ness. Uh, or no, excuse me, it's near the, uh, it's near the Moscone Center. And uh, a beautiful museum. And, uh, uh, they're building a new wing. So he, he's a member up there, and, and he's donated to the new wing, which is going to cost $500 million. Okay. And uh, he asked us if you know, it would cost less if we were to build a spacecraft like this, if we could put together a team that could do this. And the answer is yes. So he said, uh, you know, a rhetorical question is, if we can raise $500 million to be, build the wing of an art museum, can you raise less than that to save the world? And uh, so that's what we've been doing. We announced publicly um, just about seven months ago, in June of, late June of last year, our plans to do this. We built our technical team. We have a contract with Ball Aerospace. We've gone through a couple of smaller contracts. Um, uh, we have uh, very, very, uh, the very, very best technical team that, that I've ever had the opportunity to work with, uh, working with us. The team that is building the, the telescope is actually the team that built the Kepler Space Telescope, uh, which many of you know here because they have been able to find, that's, that's the telescope that's finding all of the uh, planets around other stars. So um, I, I just, this is a, a nice way of saying what, you know, and, and I'd like to X that out and say, you know, how's that Sentinel Space Telescope coming along? Because, uh, 
in some sense, you could sit around and wait for uh, others to solve the problem, or you can just go do it. Right. So, uh, what we are, what, where, the way I spend my days right now is talking to large donors and telling them that you know, here's your opportunity. Right. How often in your, in anyone's life, is someone given the opportunity to save the world? Right. And that's, you know, I, I guess it's a bit like sales in some sense. I'm selling them the opportunity to save the world. And uh, um, you know, there are people who are interested in scientific projects, there are people who are interested in art, music, all sorts of things, but there are some people who, who this resonates with. And you know, those are the people we're looking to reach. It's not everybody, but it's some fraction of people. And we're finding that the message uh, does resonate with a, with a fair number of people. So let's go back and look at the big picture again. It's really, you know, this is our planet, this is where we live, this is the only planet we've got thus far. And uh, you know, I tell, tell people, uh, you know, it's a nice planet you've got there. It would be a shame if something happened to it, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and frankly, it would be. It would be sort of truthfully the height of stupidity if as a civilization we let something really bad happen if we could have done something about it for the cost of building an overpass. Or, uh, I, I, and seriously, you look up the costs on the internet of a large freeway construction project, you're looking at about this amount of money, okay? So to me, that would be the height of stupidity if we let that happen. And um, so you, again, you have a choice in life. You can say, well, I, know, I hope somebody solves that, or you can go do it. And uh, um, that's what we're out to do right now. Um, you know, I've left plenty of technical details out of this. Um, there is a lot behind it. Um, but uh, you know, we, if people ask questions, you know, if they want to delve into some of these things, things we're happy to do that. Um, I did want to point out one other thing. It's because it's relevant to to SETI's mission. So, um, think about the fact that remember the, these ones that are large enough to kill off civilization happen at least on this planet about once every million years or so. Okay. Um, our civilization on this planet has only lasted 10,000, it's been around for about 10,000 years, right? So essentially, the clock's ticking on any advanced civilization in the sense that they're going to get reset if they don't solve this problem if they live on a planet in which asteroids exist in that solar system. At some, you know, the, the, it may not be a million years, it, it, it's going to depend upon the specifics of that system. But if the physics is any way common to our system to other systems, then other civilizations essentially have, uh, you know, you've got this sword hanging over your head. You solve this problem, or you get control alt deleted, right? And um, you know, one of the questions that we've got, you know, due to the work here, is why have we not seen anything yet? You know, there's a lot of possible explanations, you know. For, you know, we, we haven't searched everything, we, we haven't uh, looked at all, you know, across the frequency band, um, but maybe one of the things is that, you know what, civilizations have to solve this problem if they live in planetary systems in which there are asteroids. And uh, maybe that's, maybe other civilizations haven't managed to do that. And, and um, so that's on the grander scale, and, you know, as long as I, I'm philosophizing up here and you guys have to listen to me, um, you know, the way I like to look at this is we're, we're, we're trying to do something pretty, pretty amazing if you think about it, what, we're tr what you know, we meaning humanity. Um, we want to go out there and using what, using our telescopes, using the science and technology that we've developed, find and track, you know, decades out in the future what the state of that solar system is and change the solar system if needed to protect your planet. So um, at some level, this is sort of like a grand science fiction project, you know, and uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, I just loved reading science fiction. And uh, now we're actually at the point where we're really talking about doing something which is as grand as any of those projects I read about in uh, any of those science fiction books that I loved to read as a kid. And, uh, uh, and we're talking about it for real. So um, 
I'd like to just res reserve the majority of the time to the left for questions. <laughs> if uh, folks have questions, uh, I'll answer any. Thank um, you. Ed, um, if I could kick off the questions, but I'll also um, say we'll pass this around and put your uh, entries in as this comes around. Um, uh, my question was, uh, with your uh, donor base, are you uh, currently only looking at American donors or uh, worldwide? Um, uh, our donor base is worldwide, and, and I feel that it's important that we're an international project because really this is not an American issue. This is not a Canadian or a Venezuelan or a Russian issue. This is a worldwide issue. And so I think it's important that our donors be from around the world. Can you really get enough accuracy in the orbit, like 50 years ahead, to tell the teeny, teeny difference, uh, like whatever it is, a millimeter a second or something, whether it hits the Earth or goes screaming by? Uh, yes, you can. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it doesn't happen with the first observation. It happens with repeated observations. And for those that, you, that are come uh, sort of menacingly close, you, you get extra observations on those. Uh, in particular, when they come near the Earth earlier, you, you can hit them with radar and get even more precise observations, but yes. It's, it, it, the short answer is yes. Now there are some uncertainties in orbits that, that make them a little bit difficult to calculate the further out. There are some effects that are called non-gravitational. They're due to things like light pressure and there's an effect called the Yarkovsky effect. Uh, those can be modeled out and, and you can, uh, the short answer is yes, you can, you can do this. Um, oh. oh, is there another or, mic over there? Okay. Okay. I'm on, okay. Um, the table you showed in the, at the very beginning there with mm -hmm. the probability of being hit by asteroids of a certain size. Mm -hmm. uh, comets, where do they fit in that okay. picture? Comets are very much rare. They're very much larger. Uh, comets, for those who don't know, are, are things that the objects that come from, so they're not sort of orbiting in the middle part of the solar system. They go hundreds of times further out, way beyond Pluto, and then come screaming in. And uh, those are going to be much, much, much harder to see. Just crack that nut because you don't get multiple orbits in which to spot them. When you spot them, it's on its way in, inbound. And if it's going to hit you, there isn't much you can do. Um, there are roughly 100 times more asteroids than there are comets. So uh, while we can't solve that problem, I don't think that's a reason not to solve the asteroid problem. It's, 90, it, you know, it's 100 times larger. And you said the, um, the technology for deflecting was easy. But what about the politics and the diplomacy? Yeah. And yeah. I know you guys have been working on that for a mm -hmm. while. Where do you stand? The, the, the politics can indeed be difficult. But um, the reason we went off on the tack that we did of switching from looking at deflection to looking at finding asteroids is that my personal opinion is that if someone sounds a warning that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth on a certain time, date, and place, and everyone agrees that that data is correct, that adds a sense of urgency that makes decision making much easier. Uh, it, it provides a sense of clarity. It's the final exam, if you'd like, right? Um, and uh, nothing focuses the mind better than a, you know, a gigaton impact, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, just a quick question. I know you're looking at large donors, uh, and I know that you're not, you know, this is a, a fairly expensive project, uh, but are you th also considering doing something like a Kickstarter for uh, us regular folks to be a part of it? Uh, regular folks can actually already donate, um, but we have not chosen to break up our project into small enough chunks that you can put them on Kickstarter. Um, but it is actually important to us that we have a broad base of support. And I think that, you know, I think SETI, you know, another organization that, that we support that also uh, had, you know, you want a mix of, of donors, right? And, the, and uh, there is a science to fundraising. I mean, you just have to look at the big fundraising machines that are many of the major universities to see that there is a science of doing this. And we've been doing our homework and learning and how that, that whole world works. Uh, what's that? Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't, we don't have a football team, though, so. Um, when, when I saw you talk last, last year, which was great, I asked uh, how much 
you had collected and you said that data would be available at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So it's after the end of the year. I was wondering how much you have collected so far. Yeah, well, uh, I, I can be somewhat specific now. And uh, we, we have raised uh, more than $2 million thus far since, since um, June, end of June last year. Um, and our, our goal is to raise uh, you know, many tens of millions per year over the next 12 years. If you look at this mission, it's got a 2018 launch. Uh, it's got six and a half years of operation. Uh, so, you know, we, we, have to, we have to significantly scale up. Now, we've, been, we've essentially started from a standing start. And if you look at our, our profile, it, it is accelerating. So it's, it's doing what, what you have to do. Um, no one said this was going to be easy. But uh, it, it is moving. And the way this is typically done is you, you raise money uh, from folks who can contribute very large sums. But typically what they'll do is they will donate a, a moderate sum and see how it goes. And um, that's essentially our, our uh, technique. Now, by the way, I um, did want to get back to the question about how, how folks could donate. Um, you know, you can, if you go to our website, you can see these movies first off. You can, you can find out a lot more information. Our website is b6nlfoundation.org. And, uh, and you can also donate there. So um, you, can, you can sign up for, you know, our, uh, our, our, not really a newsletter, but to be kept informed of things. We have regular quarterly updates. And uh, um, you, could, you can volunteer. You can help, help make this happen. Um, again, I, I, I look at this as the people in the world have to come together and make this happen. You know, it's not, you know, we're just at the end of it, you know, running the program and stuff, but this is going to depend upon people deciding that this is important. All right? Um. Um, technical question about the data you're gathering. Does the spacecraft have an onboard computer that does calculations based on the imaging that you collect? Or do you send all of the imaging data back to Earth where it's processed? We're halfway in between that. The, the detailed orbit calculations are done on the ground. Now, we don't send all of the data back. We send the data of the, of the pixels that are showing objects that move. So the majority of the, the area of each image is, is, uh, does not have an asteroid in it. And it doesn't change. So every once in a while, you send down the whole image, but the majority of the time, you're just showing the stuff that moves. Yes, we do. We have uh, quite, a, quite a number of techniques used to reduce noise. Um, uh, yes, the, it's unclear exactly what are the raw data we're going to release, but the, the, the uh, orbits are going to be released. Um, and we felt it important that the data be public. If we are a, uh, a public foundation, that uh, you know that this data ought to be available for multiple groups to be able to do their orbit calculations and back each other up. And that's our. So we intend all of this will go into the. What we're going to do is use the existing data pipeline that's already used for observations from other observatories, and we'll just funnel into that. I'm guessing your marketing has thought of this, but if I give you money, will you name one of the asteroids after me? <laughs> <laughs> now, we have been discussing such a thing with some of the folks at the International Astronomical Union. This is the governing body that, that makes, uh, the, puts the names on things. Now, they're sensitive to us, quote, selling them. But if you actually look at the rules, the discoverer of an astronomical body may submit the name, which the IAU votes upon. Okay, so the first thing that's apparent is that their system is totally inadequate to handle the flood of discoveries we're going to make. So let me tell you a little bit about the flood of discoveries we're going to make. We, thus far, as I said before, there are roughly 10,000, you know, all, all telescopes combined throughout the last, you know, five decades have discovered about 10,000 near-Earth asteroids. We'll discover roughly that every month. Okay, So it's, I think, going to be impractical for them to vote on 10,000 new names a month. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Um, we, as the discoverers, you know, if you look at the rules, can assign, you know, who gets, you know, one of our folks can choose a name, right? Uh, can certainly submit it. Now, there are groups that have not, uh, you know, ho you know, stayed within these regulations in some sense. Um, like, for instance, the, the Mars rover that's currently up there, they're, they're, they've chosen to name features on Mars after things that they decided, and who's going to say differently, right? Because they're, they're publishing the papers on it, right? They're, they're the guys who find these things. So um, there's currently, you know, the, I think there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be a forcing function uh, uh, on the system. So, you know, we, we're, we're, we're working out the details on that. Let's put it that way. But yes, I think there, there may very well be, an I, I'm hesitant to say, you know, there will be, and this is how it's going to work. But, um, you know, if you make a contribution, then you are part of our team, and, and we get to choose, right? We get to submit. Ed, we have a couple of online questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one from Eric Dahlstrom. Seeing so many small objects with initially large uncertainty, it seems there might be the potential for many false alarms. Will this be a problem? Um, there, there is as currently because of the fact that when, when small objects are found, they're typically found only fleetingly. They, they only barely become within detectable range, and then they kind of disappear away from the Earth because we're observing invisible. Um, if you look at the range over which we will be able to track things, it's typically many months, not typically, whereas the ground-based observers vary for small asteroids, they typically only see an asteroid for days or weeks. Um, we're looking at in typically uh, six, six months or more of continuous observation, so we expect much less false alarms uh, than, uh, than uh, percentage-wise. Now, the discovery rate is so much higher, um, it's one of the things that we need to really sharpen our pencils on and figure out what we're going to do here. Um, I don't think that's a reason not to release the data, though, but I think it's something, it is, it is an issue, yeah. And uh, there was another question about uh, partnerships with uh, the companies uh, that have been uh, saying that they want to go and mine asteroids. Uh, have you been talking to those guys? Uh, we're, we're, we're certainly aware of what these guys are doing. Um, I will point out that... Uh, if you don't know where these asteroids are, there's no way you can mine them or deflect them. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I don't believe they have any way of finding asteroids. Uh, Dr. Liu, you mentioned that NASA doesn't have an appropriation to go looking for the smaller asteroids. What about anybody else, uh, Japan, China, ESA, any of those um, other countries uh, looking at this problem? Uh, no, no, and no. Uh, there is some money, but not of the, the level like this. It is uh, um, enough to do research and to run the current observatories that we have, the optical telescopes on the ground. So what equivalent uh, star magnitude uh, will you be detecting these asteroids at? Um, because these are not visible magnitudes. These are uh, infrared magnitudes. Uh, Maybe we should talk about it afterwards. I, I, it's around 24, I think, something like that, if the equivalent, in, if it was optical. Um, but let's, let's talk afterwards. I can, I can give you a more precise answer. Kilowatts per, or kilowatts per stair radian. Yeah, let's, or, yeah uh, or whatever. I, I, just don't, I just don't want to spit out a wrong number. But I, we have all that. And I'm just, it's, not, it's escaping me right now. I look at it in terms of discovery rate rather than limiting magnitude. First of all, I want to say thank you. I'm really excited you're here. And um, my two questions are, who will be deciding about deflating asteroids? What if like a group of your team decides to deflect the wrong way, I don't know, to punish humanity? And the second, is there any chance for the, how are you going to prevent the uh, telescope itself being um, damaged? Thank you. Well, this gets to the question that Jill asked. Uh, you know, who's the governing body who decides now that you know something's going to hit, what do you do? Um, and in fact, there's, uh, that discussion has been going on for a couple of years now over how you, you know, which nations get to sit at the table, right? And um, there is actually a treaty winding its way through the United Nations on just how that process would work. It's not, you know, the United Nations is not perfect, but what it does allow is the nations who 
uh, have you know significant space capability to discuss how they how they would make the decision. So the the various nations who do have significant space capability, United States, Russia, um, European Space Agency, Japan, Canada, China, they are, they are discussing this at the United Nations. Um, I don't know where that's going to go, but again, I, I think if you get a real warning, it focuses the uh, discussion um, quite well. At least that would be my hope. Um, now, uh, whether or not th th this thing um, is like other interplanetary probes, in that, uh, again, empty space is mostly empty space. Now, um, things can get hit out there, but it's, it's not that frequent because you're a small target. You're not Earth sized, you're tiny. And so your chances of being hit by stuff is actually quite low. Uh, as long as you stay out of places like, you know, the, the rings of Saturn and, and things like that where there's a lot of stuff, um, it, it's mostly empty space. Hello. Hello, Ed. Pino Pan. Uh, I have a question continuing on the funding thing. I remember when I was working down at Kennedy, we did the Stardust mission, and one of the things they had was everybody got to actually sign and put their name on there. Have you considered a funding thing like that, where if you actually put your name on something and it flew on, on Sentinel that you'd actually, you know, you pay a certain price for the signature? And, yes, uh, as a matter of fact. So we've, there's a lot of things that we've considered and a lot of things that we've talked, discussed. And, and by the way, I should refer some of these questions to Danica Remy over there. She's our COO of the B612 Foundation. Um, now, um, how this all is going to play out in the end, uh, I don't really know. One of the interesting things is that um, I should mention a little bit more about our mission. We're, we're going to be launched on a Falcon 9. Um, and uh, if you look at the capability of that launcher versus the mass of our spacecraft, we have a significant amount hundreds of kilograms of excess payload, which we can do with what we want. So again, this is something that we could give to our donors or we could use for other purposes. We, we don't know yet uh, what we're going to do with that. So it, it's an open question and we would love suggestions <coughs> from folks. You know, if, uh, as, you know, would they like to put something into orbit around the sun? You were showing the movie of the, the bunches of green dots all over the place, and you said those are all known locations. And then I thought I heard you say something that there's actually hundreds of times more than that. That's correct. So, That's because we don't know of the vast majority of so, asteroids. Right. So how, how do you come up with that hundreds of times number? And furthermore, the, uh, the odds that you show... <coughs> Are they based on the ones that you know, or are they? No, the odds. All the, uh, that's what I was trying to explain earlier with the the fact that we can count uh, craters. That's how we know how many there are out there. How often they hit the moon, for instance. That's how we know how often they hit the Earth, the large end. At the low end, we observe them with with satellites looking down. In the middle, we observe that we can count a certain region of space with our telescopes, and that's how we know we know that we haven't essentially you know, been able to observe the whole volume. We know what fraction of the volume we've observed, and we know the distribution. And so you, you again, there's no real argument about these numbers, essentially. Um, those numbers are essentially the matter of counting and dividing. So, so the odds that you show reflect the unknown ones as well, right? Yes, okay. those are the odds. So it's like and, and in fact, increase. <laughs> you could even argue that the odds of you dying from cancer or car accidents or, or plane accidents and stuff, the uncertainties of those are, are at least, they may be larger. We may know asteroid, the, the, the odds of asteroids hitting better than we know your odds of dying from cancer. So th this is not like, um, you know, in the, in the complexity of scientific questions, this isn't like calculating the Earth's climate over the next hundred years, which is an extraordinarily difficult problem. This is, a, this is counting and dividing. So very well understood. Last two questions. So, Ed, is your launch date set by the technical challenges you have to overcome or by the rate at which you expect to be able to fund this? It's, it's actually set, the, our launch date is actually set by uh, conjunction with Venus because we uh, launch inwards and so we're going to actually use the, the gravity of Venus to pull us into a final orbit around the sun. Now, that, there, there are regular conjunctions with Venus. So we have a number of different launch opportunities. But if you look at the development time of our spacecraft and the launch opportunities, there's one in early 2018. There are others. Um, so but, but it's, you know, orbital mechanics essentially dictating our launch dates. Um. <clears throat> How much of the mission is actually the cost of the satellite? And um, 
and everything else because the NSA I know offered uh, two really nice satellites that I think would fit what you have, uh, what you need. Yeah, the NSA offered uh, a completely different set of equipment. Huh. Um, those are very large optics. We don't need that. We need an infrared detector. Those are not. Um, so it, it really wouldn't wouldn't be applicable to, to what we're doing. Um, and if you look at the cost of any spacecraft, the cost of actual materials in the spacecraft is always a small percentage. It is engineering. You're building a one-off, right? Because you're, the cost of any large spacecraft is, you know, 80% engineering. And uh, then we have a launch vehicle, and then we have operations running a, a, a control center, which will be at the uh, University of Colorado. It will be in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, so when you add all that up, the, you know, the cost, you know, the spacecraft itself is probably 80%. So by, but spacecraft, in, to include all the engineering that went into building it. You know, building it, testing it, putting it on the rocket. Um, that's probably uh, 75%. Okay, um, if we have any more questions, I encourage you to come up and talk to Ed uh, yeah, so now after, after just a couple of things that we've got to do. I'll, I'll throw First, out one last ad, which yeah. is, um, again, just uh, check out our website. I think we've got a, a lot of material and information on there, videos, uh, uh, images, and ways to get involved. So b612foundation.org. And uh, we have a, a SETI small donation. Uh, it's not going to be... <laughs> Buying a satellite, but um, I maybe can sell this for a hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> potentially, <laughs> potentially, sometime in the future, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Ed for his great talk. And.